wedding message, which I trust is globally applicable across the various cultures. So wedding message. In John chapter 2, verse 2, we read, And Jesus was called to the wedding. There's no better way to start out your life as a married couple than to have the Lord Jesus be present at your wedding, to sanctify and hallow the ceremony and function with his very presence. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship has light with darkness, and what agreement or concord has Christ with Belial, and that is Satan? The Bible implicitly tells us to not marry a person who has not placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is not born again and washed in the blood of Jesus. To do that is to invite these three things. Number one, years of anguish of soul until such time they come to receive Christ as Savior and you also become one in the Spirit. Or possibly if they don't receive Christ, then you have a lifetime of anguish of soul. Second, result of getting yoked with an unbeliever. We know the spiritual status of the unsaved person. Before you and I received Jesus as our personal Savior, Jesus looked straight at the religious leaders and told them, you are of your father, the devil. So before you and me, Brother Andrew, received Christ as Savior, my father was the devil, and I lived according to the flesh. Now, if I marry willfully and willingly a person who has not put their faith in Christ, then the second I say I do during the wedding vows, I have invited Lucifer as my father-in-law. That is an extremely sobering thought. Let it sink in. Thirdly, by marrying a non-believer in Christ, we set a shocking example for all the other young people in church as we ourselves have violated what the Word of God, the Bible, has clearly told us from our youth on up. So this decision would become a stumbling block to many of the younger persons who are looking forward to be married in the years to come. Then premarital counseling. We trust that in any Christian wedding that the bride and the groom have gone through a serious course of study on premarital counseling where it covers numerous issues. This is a huge reason why premarital counseling is so very important. Not only will it cover this huge factor above about never being unequally yoked, that's the very first foundational step, but it, because it also means to displace the very foundation of any godly marriage if two persons want to get married where one is a Christian and one is not. It will undermine the very foundations of any godly Christian marriage. However, premarital counseling will also go on to cover numerous other areas. And it cannot be truly effective if one of the parties, either the bride or the groom, does not base their life on the Holy Word of God. I want to touch on dowry. In Genesis chapter 24, we see how the patriarch Abraham sent his faithful servant Eliezer on a quest to find a bride for his son Isaac. Eliezer returns with Rebecca. It's an amazing, true incident. And I note that in that story, Eliezer, the servant or the steward of the father of the groom, of the bridegroom, of the boy, he went to find a bride with ten camels loaded with the finest linen and jewelry for the bride-to-be. So in script 
picture, the boy's family sent the dowry. Did we hear that? Sadly, in most countries today, in developing countries, even in Western cultures, it seems to be the default setting where the bride's family should pay for the wedding. That too flies in the face of Genesis chapter 24. To split the cost, unless of course if one doesn't have the means, then the other can fill in the gap. We understand that. But it cannot be a, a default setting or mental attitude that the bride's family needs to underwrite. In Genesis 24, the boy's family sent ten camels loaded with the finest jewelry and the finest linen as dowry to the girl and her family. Realize this, dear friend. The culture of the Bible must trump every other culture. I've heard this phrase in developing countries. Well, wow, it's a sense of relief for the parents. We got the girls married off. What? We got the girls married off. You know what that implies? What it means? That the girls were basically a liability. They were, they were a weight on our hearts, on our minds. That we needed to find them suitable grooms. Now they've got a groom. Whew, we're relieved. You know what that implies and what that clearly means and says? It's demeaning to every girl. Even Christian families in developing countries think this way. Sir, ma'am, parents, if you're listening to this, you are guilty then. If you've ever thought that way, that you finally got your girls married off. Lord, forgive us for this attitude. I don't care what your parents or grandparents thought. Our culture is the culture of the Bible. The boy and girl are equally precious in God's sight. Praise God. Stop following the culture of the world around us. What has happened in many developing cultures the folk have become believers in Jesus, but these attitudes and mindsets have still come from the great, great, great grandparents who were not Christian. So we've come to faith in Christ, but we're still thinking unbiblically and therefore acting unbiblically. Thank you for still loving me. Having said this, both parties invariably would bring something into the marriage. Thus, all that they bring in jointly ought to belong to both bride and groom, starting with every single wedding gift, whether in cash or kind. All checks should go into a brand new joint account if they haven't set up one already towards the end of their premarital counseling before the wedding. Everything should go into a joint account where they have equal signing privileges. Likewise, any house or land or property ought to be jointly owned. Start off your marriage on the right foot, my friend. Which culture do you and I want to base the foundation of our marriage on? The Bible culture, I hope. And hear the statement, no culture ever dare say that theirs is superior to the culture of the Bible. Ephesians 5.22 passage used at most weddings, the illustration of the husband and wife and Christ. And it talks about the issue of submission. Most weddings, the minister starts with Ephesians 5.22, which I am very unhappy about. You say, why, Brother Andrew? Hear me now. Ephesians 5.22, wives, Submit to your husbands. Sir, ma'am, simple math. 21 comes before 22. Do you know what Ephesians 5.21 says? Every minister listening to this. Submit one to another. So many Christians look at it as, well, before we got married, I asked her opinion. We talked, we discussed, we listened to each other and we agreed. But the second we say, I do, woman, you listen to me. Excuse me, how did that happen the moment we said, I do? Before that, I respected her opinion. I asked her for her perspective. I listened to her. Now it's woman, you listen to me. I'm the man of the house. Hello. 
So this is why I'm not happy when ministers begin the marriage ceremony with Ephesians 5.22. It is scripture. We will talk about it. And I still love you. Please don't sign me off. <sighs> Husband, even after you say I do, ask your wife. Check with her specifically, very importantly, before making any major decision. Your wife is your most faithful, reliable, loyal, and dependable partner for life. Let me talk about verse 22. It talks about wives submit to your husbands. Correct. Verse 25, Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives. That's a command. Both these are commands. Wife, if the wife is to submit to her husband, and she is in the biblical model, then the husband is commanded to love his wife. And she is to submit to her husband as he submits to Christ. You know why most wives have difficulty submitting to their husbands? Are you ready in Christian homes and marriages? If the husband is not submitted to Christ, the wife struggles to submit to her husband. Or let's put it this way. The degree to which the husband is submitted to Christ as his heavenly bridegroom is the degree to which the wife will be submitted to her husband as her earthly bridegroom. I hope we caught that huge point. That's how submission in the Bible works. It's been said that communication and finances are the two greatest reasons for breakdown of marriages worldwide. So let's beware. Ephesians 4, 26 says, Be angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath or anger. In other words, and I speak to the men first, as oftentimes we might be the offenders inadvertently, we're still in business mode without thinking we've hurt our wives' feelings and emotions. Don't let the night pass. Try not to fall asleep without talking about it. Find out what I did or what I said or how I behaved that hurt her feelings. Keep the box of tissues ready. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath or your anger. And then finally when she opens up and shares what, what I did wrong, I need to say I'm sorry. Honey, darling, babe, whatever you call her in your lingo, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I never even thought about that. That was rash of me. That was an oversight on my part. So do all possible to resolve the dispute before you fall asleep. If not the next morning, so many bricks are built up in that wall. It's a low wall. And if it goes another day and another day, finally it becomes a huge wall between the two of you living in the same house and you living, end up living separate lives. So don't let a night pass before without discussing and resolving and apologizing. Apology does not mean to say I apologize. An apology means to say I'm sorry. I was wrong. Would you please forgive me? Can I have an amen all the men out there? Very quiet, amen. All right. You will find that in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17, the Lord Jesus says to talk things out. It's not sending a letter or an email or a text message or using some internet uh, platform to personally, physically, one-on-one, -on -one, talk about it and resolve it. Gentlemen, listen to me. Get her flowers every once in a while. Hello? Write her little love notes. I know of many wives who put a love note in their husband's lunchbox when he leaves for work. How about you writing her a love note, buddy? Remember, your wife is not your slave. She's not your personal chef. She's not your maid. She's not your secretary. She is your wife. She is your bride. As Adam says of Eve in Genesis 2.23, she is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Listen to this statement, gentlemen. You think as much of yourself as you think of your wife. How highly do you esteem and value your wife? That's how highly you esteem and value yourself. If you think 
low of your wife, then no wonder why you're going around with such a lousy, sad, beat up disposition. You honor and esteem your wife and you watch, you begin to love yourself better. Another point, you want to know the condition of a marriage? Look at the countenance of the wife. <laughs> Just look at the wife's face when the couple are together. She won't be able to hide the pathos. She may have a smile, but it'll be a sad smile if there's pain in the marriage. But if she's genuinely beaming and gleaming, then you know he's treating her like his queen, which is what she needs to be. Can I have an amen? We've heard this before. God did not create Eve from man's foot so he could step on her, neither from his head so she should dominate him, but from his side so she should be his help meet. Never ever, switching thoughts, sir, never ever dare raise your hand against your wife. Never. And ladies, wives, don't, please don't throw the proverbial rolling pin at your husband. Just as scripture exhorts us as parents not to frustrate or exasperate our children, so I say to the wives, please do not frustrate or exasperate or keep nagging your husbands. Yes, there is no excuse for a man to raise his hand in anger to his wife. But ladies, please don't push him over the edge with constant nagging, so to speak. It does not matter what your culture has shown you, or maybe even what you've seen modeled for you by your parents and grandparents. Which culture do you want to follow and live by? If I say I'm a Christian, then it's time I act like one. And remember, the husband is also to provide for, to cherish, nurture, love, and protect his wife even as Christ the church. How does Christ love the church? He loves the church so much, are you ready for this, that he laid down his life for her, for his bride. Jesus died for you and me, dear friend. Today, sadly, we've got husbands ill-treating their wives, maybe physically and emotionally abusive to them, to the wives. Shame on us, men. Shame on us. It's time we shaped up, repented before God, and asked for forgiveness. In developing countries, many a time, Christians have said to me, Pastor Andrew, in our culture, we have very few divorces, implying that their culture is superior to the Western culture. Not true, and I'm going to prove it to you. In many of developing cultures, the men lead double lives. First of all, they are physically abusive at times, emotionally abusive. The wife can't do or say much because the parents won't even take them back. It's a stigma in their society. So the wife is a victim again and again in developing countries. Not in every marriage, but I'm saying where well, there's a physical or emotionally abusive husband. And then in developing countries, they may not get divorced per se, but the man has another house with another wife. Or he just has affairs. And the wife's hands are pretty much tied. Things are changing as the economy is changing in developing countries. But for the most part, and in the lower socioeconomic groups, the wife has no say in the matter. The husband can do what he wants, go to see whoever he wants. They may not be divorced. I submit to you that this then is worse, at least in the West. If the wife is being abused, she can tell him, thank you very much. I don't need this. Goodbye. I hope you're not shocked that I stated that. Would you rather have a developing culture situation where the wife is suppressed, oppressed, depressed, beaten up, bashed up, emotionally beaten down, and the man does whatever he wants? 
that is worse, my friend. May we be honest before each other and before God. Well, thank you for still loving me and not switching me off. Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. So now, how should we behave then? May we adopt the culture of the Bible. Truly love one another, husbands and wives, by laying our lives down for each other. You know, the world has an expression, give and take. But the Bible teaches us to give and give. Jesus said, give and it shall be given unto you. He didn't say give and take. So a Christian marriage should be give and give. Let's see who can out give the other. We're not talking about money. We're talking about love, kindness, sweetness, goodness, charity, affirmation, encouragement, meeting one another's needs. Give and give. Let's see who can outgive the other. On a slightly funny note, one time in the Fiji Islands, beautiful Fiji Islands, I attended a wedding. After the ceremony was over and the bride was walking out with the groom hand in hand, I know they didn't mean it, but it was just too funny. You're going to chuckle when you hear this. As she walks out with the groom, and the whole congregation is watching, they played and sang, Because he lives, I, I can face tomorrow. <laughs> I know they didn't mean it that way, but it was so funny. I was chuckling away. Now, that's not exactly the best recessional song after a wedding. Uh, and here's a quote. I don't know who it was, but let me say it. In fairy tales, they have this saying. After the prince meets the princess, and they got married and lived happily ever after. You know what? That should be changed to, and the prince met the princess, they got married, and they began the hard work of making a happy marriage. I'll say that again. So you marry this lady, she marries you. And you now begin the hard work of making a happy marriage. And that is through a biblical resolve, a biblical commitment to each other's husband and wife. That nothing Nothing should come between you, between each of you. And a closing thought. The ideal Christian husband, ladies, you will love this, is the one who is a sanctifying husband, that is, he honors Christ in his life, who is a sacrificing husband, who lays down his life for his bride, for his wife, by loving and serving her. And only then, after being a sanctifying husband, and a sacrificing husband, can we be a satisfying husband? Ask any wife, that would be a husband to die for. God bless you.